Okay, guys, thanks for coming in. This is Pythonic Functional Programming with Coconut. Uh, my name is Anthony. Uh, I come from Indonesia. Uh, at the moment, I'm working uh, for Agoda. Uh, if you're not familiar with Agoda, it's an online travel agent. We do a lot of, um, there's a lot of machine learning projects there, uh, amongst which there are um, bidding, bit of pricing, there's uh, personalization, ranking, there's a lot of exciting things going on here. We have a really good uh, A-B testing culture as well. Um, so probably as a background, Agoda is a Scala company. So this is where the FP part comes in. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about functional programming. Um, I just want to get a sense of uh, the audience so that maybe I can skip some bits of the talk. Um, who here is familiar with functional programming? Okay, I think I need to go through functional programming. Who's heard of, co who's heard of Coconut? Nice, nice, okay. So it's, it's, I, I, it's pretty much new for everyone. So um, there are three things I want to talk about. Uh, I'll just go through functional programming very quickly. Then I want to do a bit of declarative programming, uh, which is a byproduct of functional programming. Uh, I'll have a really nice example there. And if I have time, I'll go through uh, the very basic example of machine learning pipeline in Coconut. Okay? Uh, if there's any question, just do stop me. Uh, if I'm going too fast, uh, it's better that you stop me rather than me just keep rambling on and getting people confused. Okay. So first thing is functional programming. So the key thing about functional programming is this idea of immutability. Um, once you set a value, um, you cannot change uh, its, 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 its value. And what ends up happening is you, if you cannot change things, uh, you end up writing um, pure functions. And what pure functions are is basically, if you give it the same inputs, you'll just get the same outputs. Um, So this is uh, in contrast to uh, maybe a lot of you write uh, object-oriented programming where you have stateful objects and you manage this, uh, the statefulness by uh, um, you know, encapsulating it, abstracting it out. And um, yes, so this is very different to that. Uh, I want to give you an example on uh, mutability. Uh, I hope this is uh, readable. This is a Python snippet code. Um, here I've got a function g, which uh, I don't know uh, what it does. It might be somewhere buried deep inside the code. Then I've got this function f that presumably just takes a list and then appends uh, 999 in the end. And somewhere else in the code, I declare a list, access is 1, 2, 3. Then I do g on it and then I get ys. And I apply f to access. So the question is, do we know what fxs is? Anyone? So, yeah. You don't know, right? Because g could be doing something very, very nasty to xs. It could be very sneaky and do something there. So I'll give you an example. You could do something like this, which you do mutation in g, and then you return it. And what happens here, you'd think that FXS will give you one, two, three, nine, 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 but it gives you something else. So in that sense, you can't guarantee what FXS does. And you can do something very similar with very different results. So instead of doing reverse, if you do this uh, negative uh, um, steps, it actually gives you this, a, a different list. It's a copy. So YS here is a, is a different copy than XS. So when you apply FXX, you, when you apply F to access, it, it gets you uh, where, where, where you want to be. So I want to compare this with Haskell. Has any of you uh, seen Haskell before? Nice. OK. So um, I'll go through the syntax uh, um, a little bit. But here's the idea. Like, I'm just writing the same code as I did in Python. So G is some function that takes an X. I don't know what it does. And f is, a, is, a, is another function that takes in presumably a list, and then I'm going to append 999 at the end. And then I, uh, I've got ys, which is uh, g applied to xs, and I apply f to xs. 
Now in Haskell, you can guarantee that this is this always return one two three nine nine nine, always because Haskell as a functional programming language um, forces you to have this uh, immutable values. You cannot change what XS is, and in fact, I have undefined there. I won't go through what that is, but it just doesn't matter. In some sense, you can just ignore it. So. This is very nice because actually this immutability gives you predictability. Um, you don't have to consider what other things happen in the world. You just have to consider what F does and what, what XS is. Nothing else that you have to consider. So this is, uh, you know, a lot of um, functional programming zealots would uh, tell you that functional programming makes it easy to reason about, this is what, what they mean. It's, it's predictable. Like, uh, you give it something, you know what's going to happen next. It's not sneaky, in a sense. Okay. Any question thus far? So that's just a very brief overview of functional programming. So next I want to talk about declarative programming. And if you can't change things, you end up writing definitions. Instead of doing imperative programming, you do declarative programming. And instead of doing do this, do this, do this, do this, you do this is this, this is that, this is this, this is that. Yeah? So this is where declarative comes from. And I want to show you with an example what I mean by this. It'll be uh, clearer. Uh, and I want to do this uh, very basic example. Who, who's familiar with this sieve of Eratosthenes? Yeah? Yeah. So this is a very common uh, example in, in uh, the programming language world, right? So the idea here is that you want to get a stream of, um, infinite stream of prime numbers. Yeah? And the idea is that uh, you start with two, and then you count to infinity, and then you take the head of the list, and then you filter out things that are divisible by the head of the list. Whatever you have next is a prime number. Take the head again, filter out everything uh, at the tail of the list, things that are divisible by the head. I have a little uh, animation going on here. So you take the head, two, which is a prime number, you filter, out, you filter everything else out that's divisible by two. Then the next one will be a prime number. Then you filter them out. Next one will be a prime number, and so on and so forth. Here, I only have 120 different things, but we want it to be infinite. So we, we, we have to do this uh, filtering out as we go. We okay with the sieve algorithm? Yeah. Okay, so I want to start with Haskell, just to show you where I'm going with this. So here we have um, uh, just a type declaration primes is a list of integers, ints, um, and the definition is yet apply sieve to this infinite list, list, two to infinity, where sieve here is just, well, take the head, so this, this here is pattern matching, it's called pattern matching. You know that the argument of sieve is going to be some sort of a list that has a head and, a head and has a tail. You grab its head, put it in the at the head of your new, new list, and then you apply sieve recursively to stuff that you've already filtered out, uh, the things that are divisible by the head. And obviously this is an, an infinite list, so I, can have, I cannot have a look at it uh, forever, but uh, here I can say, please give me all the primes that are less than 60, for instance. So I want to show you my Python implementation of this. Uh, I don't claim that this is the best way to do this, but this is what I came up with. Um, this is it. So I just want to write uh, something that, I, that feels a bit like Haskell, right? Uh, so here we have sieve, uh, we have primes, and primes is just sieve of count two. And if you know count two from iter tools, that's just the generator from two counting all the way to infinity. Yeah? And I apply sieve and apply sieve inside the body of the function. Uh, this is basically uh, what I described before. Grab the head, yield it, and then yield from with the recursive uh, 
definition that uh, of the tail where you remove all the stuff that are divisible by it. And notice here there's a, a mutation. The, the numbers here, what I use numbers here, it's a di this different numbers from here. Why? Because next is a stateful operation. Because you grab the head and then now you have the tail. It's, uh, uh, yes. And this is the same thing. List take while. Uh, this is basically the same as the one in Haskell, but then in, in Python you have to do this list thing because uh, if you don't do it, it'll just give you a generator and you can't have a look at what's inside. Uh, so it's a bit pesky, but that's how it is. And yes. So now I want to introduce coconut. And coconut is a functional superset of Python. So whatever is valid Python is also valid coconut. Okay? And coconut will compile down to Python. So you haven't missed anything, like this is absolutely no change in the code. It's the same thing. Uh, but I want to introduce a f you know, several things such that I can write like, as if I was writing Haskell. Yeah? So I'm going to introduce a, a few things. The first thing I'm going to introduce is a more concise lambda syntax. See here we have to write lambda like this. And, uh, what if we can just do that? So this might be a, a small thing, uh, like a nice syntactic sugar, but if you want to write in a functional style, the way you, you parameterize behavior is you pass functions around. And if you don't have like a really nice way to make um, functions at this, on the spot, then you're just not going to do it. Like it's, it's, when I'm writing Python, I don't write a lot of pandas. Oh, sorry, pandas, lambdas. Um, I, do, I do use pandas. Uh, but if, if it's easier, I would. So the next thing I'm going to do is this forward piping. If you have um, seen F sharp before, so instead of having like um, functions that, uh, so you have a lot of brackets like, like this, you can do forward piping instead. Stop, start with primes apply this, so this is the same uh, lambda syntax as I had before, then apply this. So it's just a matter of style. I like this. Uh, Haskell doesn't even do this. People there, like a lot of people there hate it. And uh, I, I think it's nice. And the next thing I'm going to do is currying. So currying is partial application. So if you write Python, then you, you'll know about the partial uh, library, right? So uh, take while here is basically you're just applying all those numbers to the second argument of take while. And what if we just have this operator that makes it um, a partial application? Again, this, this is like just syntactic sugar, right? But if you have to import partial and then you have to do it and then it becomes very, very long, you're not going to do it. But if you just have to put like some sort of a, a partial application symbol, then maybe it's easier. So we're carrying on. Um, next one is iterator training. So instead of yield and then yield from, essentially yield and yield from is just stuff that you want to make a new generator. So you put the head first, and then you yield from something else. So this is iter uh, just generator ch chaining. And in Coconut, you can basically do that with uh, a straightforward syntax with this kind of double colons. Yeah? So again, no big deal. It's just uh, more syntactic sugar. Then this, there's pattern matching. If you know that you're going to get a list, then you can decompose it straight away, just like what, how we did this in Haskell. You, you're going to use the head and the tail. Instead of accepting the list, hey, grab me the head and then leave me with the tail, you decompose it in the function definition, in the, in the argument list. So this becomes uh, more concise. And next thing is function assignments. So in a lot of functional programming language, you deal with expressions. Your return value is just the last value that you have on the, on the expression. Uh, 
And what happens here, instead of having the colon and return, you just have equal sign. And whatever's the last thing, that's, that's, the, that's what the function's going to return. So here we get rid of all returns. And finally, built-in higher order functions. Like you, you, you don't have to import this, import that, if you want to write functional uh, style code. Yeah? Um, so, uh, reduce used to be built in. Now you have to import it. And it's, it's one of those things that if, if you write functional code, you use it all the time, but now you have to import it, you might as well write a list or something. Uh, you might as well write a loop or something. Yeah? So I'm not saying that it's impossible to, for Pyth to write functional style uh, code in Python, but it definitely makes it, it doesn't make your life easy. And I'm not, you know, coconut is just, um, you know, makes, makes your life a bit easier. So, so this is just a comparison for uh, the, all the stuff that we've applied. Um, and what I want to point out is that um, earlier I uh, made this uh, distinction between imperative and declarative programming. If you look at the, what Python does, the, what you end up doing is imperative programming. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Whereas in the coconut one, you say primes is, has this definition with sieve count. And sieve has this definition. Okay? Any questions on this? Uh, I'll carry on. And this is just to show how remarkably similar the coconut version and the Haskell version is. And uh, I typically like to write my code like this, but then I also want to have NumPy, Pandas, TensorFlow, everything in Python. So, so this is, may, might be a nice compromise. So I want to move on to do, instead of comparing stuff, I would just want to build something that's uh, with coconut. So here, this is machine learning pipeline. If you work in machine learning, this is very, yeah, it sucks, okay. Uh, so this might be very familiar to you. Basically, you have a lot of stuff that you want to, you start with a raw data, the data frame then you might, you might want to apply transformations around it. Then you have this notion of estimators. What happens in estimators is that during training, you look at your training data, and then you maybe derive some insights to, uh, on it. Then during test time, you know how to transform the, 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 the whatever data that comes next. So there are actually two operations here. There's the fit, which goes from here to here, there's a transform which goes down. Okay? And this is just uh, I'm trying to simplify things. This is saying the same things, but uh, hopefully this simplifies things. You have two operations here. There's transform that takes a data frame, gives you back a data frame, a new data frame. Then there's fit. If you see an estimator, then you can do something with the training set, and then you know how to transform it in the future. That, but if you see a transformer, you do nothing. Like, it's already a transformer. You can't fit a transformer. You just give it back. Then this is pipeline, where you stack stuff together to make it into a bigger, uh, more, do more useful things. So this, if this seems familiar, I've taken a lot of it from Spark's uh, pipeline. So I want to start building this in Coconut. And I'll start uh, with, OK, so in Haskell, you can do a similar thing, but using the types, just using the types. So uh, basically doing this image, but no, imp no implementation, nothing, just the types. And then it kind of gives you a map on where you want to go. Uh, estimator, estimator gets a data frame, gives you a transformer, a transformer gets a data frame, gives you another data frame, and a stage of a pipeline is either an estimator or a transformer, 
and you have these two uh, operations and one that stacks them together. So in Coconut, well, you'll have something like this. So there's a new keyword called data. So if you write Scala, it's a bit like a case class. So it's just a container to you to, you can pattern match stuff on later on. And here we're saying an estimator has a fit function. A fit function will give me a, a transformer when I see the training data. And a transformer has a, a transform function that when, a, when I've got some data, I know how to transform it to a new data. Okay? And transform is really, really easy. It's a one-liner. Uh, give me a transformer. So this is a, this pattern matching here. So if you don't give it a transformer, it'll say match error. Uh, so it'll fail. Um, give me a transformer. That transformer must know how to transform a data to another data, a data frame to another data frame. And I just apply that. So this is transform. Then there's fit. If you get an estimator, then you know how to transform a data frame to a transformer. You just pick that and then just apply that. But if you have a transformer, just give it back the, the transformer. So both these functions return a transformer. OK? So what about pipeline? What about if you want to do a lot, of, a lot more stages? So the idea here is that you might have an estimator and a transformer, estimator, transformer, whatever. And you have to call fit, transform, and then for the next stage, fit, transform, fit, transform. And then you have uh, all these transformers which you compose. You can write it, like, if, if you just go on Python and then write what I just said, I don't know, I, I, I came up with something like this. The, like, this is not nice. I don't like this. So this is a very uh, topical meme. It's like, uh, don't, don't do this. Uh, it's not nice. But instead, if we look at the type, you have a list of things, then you make it into one thing of the same thing. So it's actually a monoid. So this, is, this appears all the time in mathematics, uh, category uh, theory in, uh, in, in particular. And this is well known in, in, in Haskell, like this exists. What a monoid is, th there's some rules of monoids, but there are two things here. There's a, an empty monoid, which gives you something, in this case a stage, a pipeline stage, and then there's something called an append, monoid append. Gives you two of the same things and makes one of it. And think about it, if you have a list of these things, if you can combine two to make one, you can combine arbitrarily many into one. And here there's a concat function, which is just a, um, it's a reduce of these two things, which, um, Give me a list of these things. I'll give I'll give you one of the of that thing, okay. And the idea here is that you can implement this in Coconut. An 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 an, em, um, an empty monoid is just a transformer that does nothing to your data frame. And if I want to do append two transformers, I know exactly how to do that. It's just a transformer just gives you a DF, and then it returns a DF, and there's another DF, and then it gives you another DF. And you just compose the function. And here, this is a compose kind of uh, another synthetic sugar. And the idea here is that, well, if I've got two stages that are not transformers, what do I have to do? Well, give me the left one. I'll fit it. And I have to transform my initial DF with the, with the transformer that it gives me. And then I'm going to fit the second one. Now I have two transformers. But I know how to combine two transformers. So this is a recursive call to append. Then you have your, your, your combined estimator. And so if I, kn I know how to combine two, how do I combine a lot? More than that, you use reduce. You just reduce the, uh, uh, this operation to a lot of the stages. And actually, monoid concat is 
pipeline. Uh, then I, I wrote um, you know, this example of one hot encoder. It's not so important, but what strikes me is that this is very similar to writing a class, but without writing a class. It's, uh, you're, you're still building on pure functions, um, but it's, uh, you don't have to do these ceremonies of def, init, self, whatever you have, and then the dev and self again. So that is it from me. Um, I hope that's uh, useful if there's any questions, perhaps. No? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is in GitHub pages. I'll, uh, or should we do this? Maybe I'll, I'll give you a link. Yeah. OK. Um, question? So oh. Yes, it's a superset of Python, so you can write TensorFlow with Coconut. But I do not, like, just a caveat, I don't write production code in Coconut, yeah? Because that's very much still experimental. If I want to write, like, something cute or, like, something small, like, I, I fired up. Like, it has integration with MyPy, with Jupyter, uh, all of these stuff. It's, it ex exists. Uh, yeah. uh, we have one, one here. And, uh, uh. Does it uh, transform to Python or compile to Python? So is it a tr syntactic transformation of Python? or It uh, compiles to Python. Um, yes. To readable Python or bytecode? So, uh, no, a readable Python. Mm, a readable Python, but it's not, it's not great. So but uh, you, th there is actually um, an, an option when you compile to Python, make it more readable so that you've got the coconut stuff. and uh, No, you've got the Python. And then as comments, you've got the, co uh, the coconut stuff, so that you know which, where it's going to. Uh, so would you do that for production code? I, I could, but there's some bugs still. Yes. Uh, any more questions? Yeah. Doesn't actually improve the processing time or runtime. No, no, no. no, no. Uh, so it might even run slower and run. I'm, I, I don't. I'm not sure, but it, it's basically still Python, and I wouldn't even say that it, it saves you time from writing code. It allows you. It makes your life easier to write a different yeah. style of code. Yeah, I, I think it, it yeah. helps you to write shorter code, right? And also in like fun functional programming style. But when yes. you, because you said it compiled into Python, yes. meaning you don't get any any processing. Mm -mm. Same time in that. I, I'm not as far as I know. Thank you, man. Yes. Uh, in your opinion, did uh, functional programming hurt uh, performance? Sorry, excuse me? Uh, I, I just to ask uh, your opinion uh, is uh, functional programming, programming uh, hurt performance? Because as I know, in uh, build function, uh, uh, we have to clone own input in, instead mm, of mm, reference mm, if need. Mm, 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 mm. So there are functional data structures that allow you um, to uh, do a similar kind of things without um, cloning a lot of stuff. So the idea is that if you commit to yourself that you're not going to change stuff, then you can use what's called a persistent data structure. So say a list, and then you're just going to change the head, you can still use whatever uh, the tail is. You just have to change the head. So uh, in that sense, it's not really uh, expensive. But I'm not sure uh, how far uh, Coconut is there. 